my very first extemporaneous podcast, so please bear with me. Gabby's in the background making sure I'm okay, because <laughs> I've never done this before. Okay, but I've told stories forever, so this is the story of how I finally understood what money is, and it's a long, complicated story, uh, though I'll try to keep it as short as I can and still give the meaning. And it has benefited not just me, but other people in my life uh, on a number of occasions. It begins when I was a junior in um, high school. Actually, no, I'd like to go back even further than that. I'd like to begin when I was six years old, walking down the street with my friend Fred, both of us children of doctors. I knew very well that I was one of the privileged people in our town of Twin Falls, Idaho, because my father was a doctor. We went to Catholic school and the nuns just, you know, worshipped the kids of doctors. It was real clear to us. We got the front row seats and so forth. Um, and one day I was walking down the street with my friend Fred and across the street from us was a kid in our class called, his name is was Lorenzo Ortega. And he was one of what we called the wetbacks back in um, that age. And they were confined to the outskirts of town where they lived in shacks and, um, you know, did the farmer's fields for harvesting and so forth. And they sat in the back row of the churches. And I had this distinct understanding going down the road that day that the fact that I was a daughter of a doctor and Lorenzo Ortega was the daughter of laborers of a different color was completely accidental. That it didn't give me any more inherent value than anyone else. And I remember being struck by that. So here we're talking value and money has to do with value. I was struck by that understanding that, oh my God, we're just the same, we're equals. I didn't even say anything to Fred because it was such a weird thing to think. It was completely out of character, out of character for someone that's six years old, but it was nevertheless true. Okay, fast forward to when I was a junior in high school and uh, my dad was a doctor, as I said, so I got to, to do um, a job in the summertime of being at the hospital and what they gave me to do was to translate to, I should say, reformat a nurse's, uh, a nurse's um, book into, you know, different, different format. And I used an old typewriter, of course, to do it. And I was stuck in a room by myself with a big round clock on the wall that I would check frequently. And it was excruciatingly boring. And of course, no mistakes. You couldn't make any mistakes back then. Um, or you'd have to, I don't even think we had whiteout back then. You had to start over again. So, uh, and I noticed that I would go down to coffee breaks and lunch breaks, like all the other workers, and sit there, and all the people would talk about was what they were gonna do when they got off work. It was clear to me, even as a kid of that age, that work was something that adults did and that they didn't like. And I knew then, too, that work had to do with getting money, okay? Of course, I was getting a dollar an hour, which I was supposed to apply to my college education, which I did. Did the same thing the next summer. By this time, I was so frustrated with the entire experience that I started walking home every day after, after work, you know, the four miles or whatever it was, because my fury and my frustration was so great. Meanwhile, while I was there, I would get a a, um, you know, a not, a, I'd get, what is it called, gum that comes in, get gum that has five sticks in each one, and I would take one stick an hour to get through the day. I would look at the clock, okay, so it was like I was regulating myself through getting through the next hour by putting another stick of gum in my mouth. I mean, that's how I got through it. It was horrifying. And that summer, I decided I would never be an adult if that's what adults do. And I never have, actually. Okay, I went to school for a long time, so I didn't have to make money. And I, you know, got grants and um, 
scholarships and my parents paid for part of it. And then we had some loans, but hardly anything compared to what kids have to go through now. And then I was married and my husband, it was a typical marriage. My husband was the bread owner. I was staying at home. And then I had a job finally um, at a new college of California where I was uh, fired for being too experimental after one year. And that job was not a typical job, so I could do it. Um, but then it turns out I couldn't do it because I was too much out of the box for the way they thought. And that's another whole story, but I'm not gonna talk about it now. Okay, so then I marry my high school boyfriend. And again, he's the wage earner and I'm at home. And by this time I'm going, what am I doing with my life? And I loved him very much, but I realized, and this is another story too, long version I'm not gonna tell, but I realized I was supposed to leave after two years, even though it felt incredibly safe and secure for me. And I know still that women especially will enter marriages for safety and security and uh, survival. Survival sometimes dictate it, dictates it, or it seems to. Okay, so at this point, I had studied astrology long enough so that when I left and Dick helped me leave, he finally got to the place where he could agree that I could go, um, I think I had $3,000 to, to set me up. And then I started doing readings for for money. So in other words, I became a consultant. I was doing my own work, which I totally recommend to people. Do your own work for whatever is passionate for you, whatever you absolutely love, make that your work. And then yes, have some kind of exchange from that work. So that's what I did. And of course it was very slow to begin and then it ramped up after a while. Okay, meanwhile, there, here's where the story normally starts. I started going with a guy that was real rich, a doctor. <laughs> and I was poor still, of course. I was just, um, you know, living hand to mouth, um, couldn't go out except for coffee, uh, you know, just kept my nose to the grindstone. Okay, I was with this doctor who is rich. And, um, and remember, I was living close to the bone. Okay, so all we could do is go out for coffee because of course I was a feminist. I was going to pay my own way no matter what, which caused a bit of friction between us um, because well, first of all, I resented him for having more money and he resented me for not being able to do more. And finally, he said to me, hey, Annie, we're using your, survive, your survival money and I'm using my luxury money. Why don't we both use my luxury money and then it'll feel okay to you and realize that it's no big deal. And I'll tell you, that was such a revelation because what he did was reframe the whole context by saying there's luxury money and that there's survival money and I was confined to survival money and he was not. Okay, so what that led to was a complete uh, renaissance in our relationship in terms of the kinds of things we did. We'd go out to dinner, we'd go on ski trips, you know, we went to Seattle one time to see King Tut's remains, I remember that. Uh, we did all sorts of stuff that I wouldn't do myself. And for me, it didn't matter. I didn't, I didn't care about doing it or not doing it that much. It wasn't like I was with him because he had money, because he had that luxury money. But I loved being with him. It was fun to be with him. And, okay, so go on for another year. And then one time we're out to dinner and it's a really cold night with a big winter storm. And we're out to dinner and he, and we're, you know, we're drinking our wine. And he says to me, Annie, it's great that we're using my luxury money uh, rather than your survival money. But he said, you could say thank you once in a while. Now that remark absolutely sent me into, I don't know where, some kind of hell. I was like complete chaos, complete confusion. It felt like that was not fair. I didn't know why it wasn't fair, but it didn't feel fair. I was so riled up by this that I rose from my, my seat. My, our food hadn't even come yet. I put on my coat, I walked home through the snowstorm, like just 
in fury. I, I couldn't believe how furious I was. So for the next three days, he tried to call me, and I just refused to, to speak with him. And all the time, I was going through this internal, um, it was like a cauldron. I was like an internal cauldron. Things were moving around inside me that I didn't understand. But then all of a sudden, it came clear. Money is not the bottom line. The bottom line is human energy. And some people's energy translates into money easily. Some does not, depending on their roles in the culture. <laughs> and I, who had been with him for two years now, had been acting as his psychiatrist, really, and he was very grateful for that, though he never would have said that. But the point was, there was an equal exchange. There was, there was an equal exchange of energy all along. My human energy translated differently than his did. And I said that to him on the phone. I finally called him up and I said, I've made this recognition. Well, just as I had been thrilled by his reframing money into luxury money and survival money, so my reframing money as a form of energy and not the bottom line energy, but instead human energy is the bottom line, thrilled him. We had reframed it again. I had reframed it through this incredibly intense internal process that drove me almost crazy, but it, I, I allowed it. I stayed with the process until something you know, flew out, which is this whole new understanding of what money is. Okay, the result of that was, oh, wow. So we bought me a house, okay? As a result of that, we bought me a house with his money. And because we had used his money, and here I was in this wonderful house that had a, had a um, place that I then became the, um, um, what do you call it? What do you call it? Kiln. It had a place for kilns. It had a place for stuff like that. And so we put that in there. And then we put, I decided I'd start a magazine in for my hometown so I could give the energy back. So he was giving, gifting me with this. So I would continue to gift forward. So it's like paying it forward, as we say now. And so I started this magazine called Open Space inside the town of Twin Falls, my hometown, which was aimed to gather the people in the town who were not basing their social life on organized religion and see who we were. Just bring us all out of the corners and see who we were, which was an extraordinary experiment which went on for a couple of years. And that experience with this man, our relationship lasted about another year and then we both moved on. But the point was we had come to this amazing understanding. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say about it. When we bought the house, our friends all thought, in typical cultural terms, aha, the rich doctor buys his mistress a house. But that's not how we were thinking about it. We were thinking about it as an equal exchange. But my exchange, my energy was invisible. Money energy is not invisible. My energy was invisible, but it was very, very real. And so, not very long, because we did not think in the usual cultural framework, our friends then gradually moved into our atmosphere, the way we were thinking about it. So from then on, it was this community space that I was in charge of, that he was sponsoring, and we had a grand time. Okay, and the reason I wanted to tell this story is that through the years, I have told this story to many, many women, especially women, because it usually still is the case even, even in the Me Too era, even in the fierce feminist, third wave, I'd call it, of feminist er, feminism era, we still have um, a differential between men and women, and especially as long as we get married, and if one person goes to work and the other stays home, then it seems to, to all of us that the person who goes to work is worth more than the person who does not, because money is more visible and this invisible energy that keeps a household going um, is not valued in our culture. 
And so I've said this, I've shared this with a number of people and every time it's a revelation and it helps them understand themselves better, which was of course the point for me to understand myself better, give my, recognize my own value and the value that I therefore had in any relationship, no matter what it was. And that recognition of money then has been generalized more so that now I see it more sociologically and recognize that money, this human invention of ours, nature does not use money. So that means something. I think of money as a scrim or a, a surface layer upon nature that we think of as the bottom line. And we tend to have that as our filter for seeing everything, including nature. And that is a real blindness that we all have to what's real. And so what we're trying to do here in this community is live below money as far as possible, below money into what's really real, to appreciate the natural energy that flows continuously filling up, spilling over, you know, constantly filling up and spilling over. And, and it's not at all measured by how much money you do or don't have. So that's the first extemporaneous podcast. Thank you.